singularity. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a brief review on iTunes or by simply becoming a patron via interviewthefuture.com. Now, some of you may know that I've been working on a new book, provisionally titled Rewriting the Human Story, How Our Story Determines Our Future. And so I thought it could be useful to me and hopefully interesting to you if I were to have a conversation with a few story experts and ask them questions such as why story, what is story, and perhaps most importantly, how does story relate to technology, artificial intelligence, being human, and our future? Well, my guest today on the show is Jonah Sachs. Jonah is an author, speaker, and viral marketing pioneer. He helped to create some of the world's first and still most heralded digital social change campaigns. His work on Amnesty International's Blood Diamonds viral film was seen by 20 million people and was delivered to every member of Congress, thus helping drive the passage of the Clean Diamond Act. Jonah later helped to create the story of stuff, which viewed by over 60 million people marked a turning point in the fight to educate the public about the environmental and social impact of consumer goods. Jonah has led groundbreaking campaigns for Greenpeace, Human Rights, and the ACLU, as well as major brands including Microsoft and Patagonia. Finally, Jonah is the author of Winning the Story Wars, Why Those Who Tell and Live the Best Stories Will, live the, will Rule the Future, and most recently, Unsafe Thinking, How to Be Nimble and Bold When You Need It the Most. So, welcome to Singularity FM, Jonah. Thanks, glad to be here. Fantastic. I've been looking forward to our conversation because um, I actually read your book twice, uh, your, your first book, uh, Winning the Story Wars, because first I tried to save my eyes. So first I listened to it as an audio book, and mm. the moment I finished the audio version, I just went ahead and bought the Kindle version so that I can actually start taking uh, notes. And I'm using references to your book in part one and, and part two of my own book throughout. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I really appreciate your work. Which lead us to, leads us to our first question. Why do you think any one of us should even care about story? What's the big deal about story? I think that stories are kind of the root of who we are as human beings. You know, people who are want to find community with one another, who want to define themselves as part of a tribe, they use stories to say, this is us. And the stories that we share give us our kind of core identity. I mean, what you're asking is such a big question in that there's so many reasons that we look to stories. So there's the big societal level, like our core stories make us who we are. There's the level at which stories are like reality simulators so that young people or, or anybody doesn't have to live the same mistakes as our ancestors or as our neighbors, because when we hear a story, we're getting these core life lessons. Um, I think most importantly, though, in my model of storytelling, uh, values are at the center of any story. What they are are kind of carriers for core values. So if you care about sharing your core values, seeing them spread throughout a culture, a community, a family, learning to express them through storytelling is the most effective way to get others to share them as well. And so I think anybody who's in the, uh, in the field of trying to persuade anybody else of anything should care about telling stories. Absolutely, absolutely. And where is, what's Jonah Sachs's personal story? In other words, what's your journey of kind of discovering story and the importance of story? How did you get to that conclusion that you just shared with us? Yeah. So um, in about 1999, I was starting a company 
to basically do graphic design for social change. I first had this idea that the internet was gonna be this huge, exciting new thing and democratize voice and everyone would have a chance to be heard. And I thought that was fantastic. I was just getting out of college. Um, I didn't quite see where the internet would take us, you know, 20 years later um, into a kind of strange perversion of all of that. But at the time, it felt like anyone could speak. And I thought, this is a great time to start a company to help the causes that I care most about get heard because you don't need that million dollar campaign anymore. All you need is to put something up and if it's worthy of being seen, it, it will be. And so I started exploring that and before long um, got involved in making what were called flash videos at the time. So people didn't really even know that things on the screen could move or make sounds. So if you made a little video, you know, it had to be less than hundred kilobytes for anyone to see it, but you know, you could get some attention. So we started experimenting with making these really crude, not, you know, crude in terms of graphics and sound, very low quality videos for maybe five or $6,000. And we were starting to see some of them going quite viral and getting, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands and millions of views long before YouTube, you know, even existed. It's actually quite expensive to, to spread videos once they got too viral because you had a pay per view. And then at some point, uh, we decided to make a film about factory farming because we thought that that was really a nexus between uh, human rights, animal rights, the environment, um, human health. And we, we were looking for a way to express it. We knew that people didn't want to hear about the gross places that their meat was coming from. And then we had this you know, epiphany. What if we made a spoof of the matrix? Because the reality is so much worse than we ever let ourselves see. So we made this matrix spoof, called it the matrix, of course, and put it out there and you know, sent it to a couple thousand people on our list. And you know, before long, it was the number one most blogged about thing on the internet for a week. It was seen by tens of millions. We, we literally had to raise money just to be able to keep showing it to people. And it spread like wildfire. Not long after that, we made another spoof and that was a spoof of, of Star Wars called Grocery Store Wars. It was another food, food film. And again, you know, it, it went everywhere on the internet. And I started asking myself, you know, why are certain things going so viral and other things just get forgotten right away? And, you know, I didn't think that those films were necessarily the, the best films we ever made or the funniest, um, but they spread. <clears throat> and, you know, to be honest, one day I just Googled Star Wars and The Matrix in the same string and up pops Joseph Campbell because Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, directly informed both of those films. Both of those films were created on the hero's journey, you know, Campbell's template for all stories. And I hadn't really read about this or heard about this. So I dove into that, you know, looking at the sign in your background, I kind of followed the white rabbit down that hole and um, suddenly learned that within each of us are these inborn templates for mythology and to love myth and to listen to certain kinds of stories. And the reason that some of my videos were going viral were because they were riding along on the pathways that are basically baked into our brains. We want to hear these stories. And I have theories about why we can talk about later. Um, and so I realized that it wasn't about how funny I could be or how clever I could be with my marketing, you know, where I placed my marketing, but could I leverage ancient myth? Could I leverage story patterns to get people to care? And it was really about the story that you were telling that made people want to pass it on to their friends, make it part of their identity. And so I started lecturing about that. And then Harvard Business Review approached me and asked me to write a book about, you know, stories and Eventually uh, that became winning the story awards about not just viral marketing, but about how the different stories kind of compete for our attention and how brands and organizations who really want to spread better values and culture can use stories to, to be heard. Wow, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. Let me just take a little digression here from the primary topic of our conversation here and ask, why did you care about factory farming? The Matrix is a fantastic viral video. I recommend people Google it and check it out. It's really, really excellent. But why did you care about that particular issue? Are you vegan? I'm vegetarian. I have been since I was 14 years old. And, you know, I think one of the formative experiences for me was taking an ethics class in eighth grade and um, learning about where our meat came from. And as sort of as a core ethical, it was used as sort of a core ethical canvas to discuss how our values are lived or not lived in the world. And I had always, you know, I love animals. I've always cared about animals, but really coming face to face with the reality of how we treat animals in the society 
you know, was shocking to me and it changed my life. So I kind of always carried that with me. Um, it wasn't until later that I realized that factory farming was really a nexus of, you know, way workers are treated, the way communities and environment are treated, the way our health is, is treated, and just became to me like this great social ill. You know, to be honest, I, I was actually approached by a few factory farming giants after the, the, the Matrix was made because they wanted to tell their own story and they thought maybe they could enlist me to sort of tell their story. I'm not sure. I guess that's how it goes in the, in the world. You kind of get co-opted. I resisted those calls, but... Um, I'm sure they offered you a pretty penny for it. A, a lot more than the, uh, yeah, than the nonprofits that, that did yeah. it. Yes. Well, good for you. I, I'm really impressed and proud of you. And that, that would mean that you have been vegetarian for what, 25, 30 years now? Uh, a little more than 30 years, yeah. Wow, that's really impressive. Wow. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Well, and especially good for you for kind of like resisting the, the temptation and, and foregoing all the benefits of kind of, you know, working with the big guys and, and giving them what they want. That's that's like pretty impressive. Like, wow, good for you. Thank you. I, I have a kind of formative story about that as well, which is, you know, when I, when I got out of college, I was thinking about the internet with one of my best friends from growing up who started the company with me. And the first idea that we had was to kind of, we love treasure hunts as kids. We used to build these elaborate treasure hunts. I still love them. I still make them for my children. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if the internet, you know, barely anyone was on it, you know, at the time, uh, or, you know, it's pretty new at the time, if there were treasure hunts on the internet where people could go around to different sites and get clues and then, you know, ultimately get prizes. And then of course the sites would pay us to drive traffic. And so we started making lists of all the you know, big companies that we could work with to, to do these treasure hunts. And we got pretty far down this road of this idea. And then we looked at each other one day and it was like, well, why do we want to drive more traffic to Burger King? Like, well, what, what do we get <laughs> from that? And um, I started to realize that, you know, if you're going to pick up a megaphone and shout as loud as you can, you know, would you want to shout something that you wouldn't want to whisper to a friend because you don't believe it? Or, you know, or you doubly are a hundred times more likely or more, more responsibility to say something that you mean. And so I just kind of took that lesson. And when we first kind of went out in the world, really with no experience and no real skills, we just said we only work with values-based organizations. And I think that because we made that stand, that's why our business actually worked. And had we not taken that stand, we would have just been one of a million other companies out there. So I, I felt like I always owed my success to staying to with my values. And so it became easier and easier to just not take, you know, jobs that I thought would sort of undermine my values and thus undermine sort of the agreement I had made with the universe, which had, you know, blessed me with a successful company. And in return, I wasn't going to like undermine that by taking jobs that I didn't believe in, picking up that megaphone and lying to millions of people. And I think a lot of creative people just assume that's what you have to do. If you want to keep making your films, keep doing your design, keep writing your copy, you're just going to have to do it for the people who are going to pay you. And it doesn't matter who. And I found that success is easier when you focus on the things you care about most. Wow. That's a phenomenal message. Yeah. Because precisely most people believe that the price of success is compromising your values and your ethics, but actually you're telling us that it's the other way around and that if you start with your message, the path to success is easier and shorter. And of course, a lot more satisfying than otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. And I mean, look, if, if you're going to try to make, a, especially in the field of creativity, if you're going to try to do something creative about something that you don't believe in, you're really going to struggle to figure out how to be brilliant. I mean, of course, there's many brilliant campaigns for many people who didn't believe in what they were doing. But when you're passionate inside about something and you, you're living that thing, you have so much more ability to be authentic and to be creative. And I think that the kind of muse speaks to you so much better. Um, you know, it's not to say that we don't have to all make compromises at some point in our lives. And I don't judge people who, who do, but I think that there's a less explored path that really is, um, is fruitful, that is sort of dismissed quite quickly because people feel they need to be realistic. And, you know, I think it's more realistic to follow, follow your values than to, uh, to sell out right away. Yeah. And that's where the subtitle of your first book comes in, which is called winning again, winning the story wars, why those who tell and live the best stories will rule the future, right? So you put explicit stress on live. So just telling is not sufficient. It's always better to live your message. And, and I've always believed in that same idea too, 
because my my own background is kind of ancient Greek and Roman ethics, and the best examples of that are people who actually live their message. And you know, we have some very notable exceptions, like perhaps arguably Seneca and Cicero, who are this these fantastic Roman Stoic philosophers, brilliant writers, brilliant speakers. Uh, at so many levels, and yet they kind of fell consistently short of their own kind of message. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Seneca kind of, and maybe even Cicero kind of uh, made up with with their deaths uh, for for the the omissions uh, during their lives. But that's that's a debatable point. Anyway, mm -hmm. let's go back to the topic of story, because that's what we're here for today mainly. And start with the definition. You see, my, my audience is uh, very scientific. Um, and so it always helps us to define the things that we're talking about. So what is story? How do you define story? Yeah, so um, I don't know if this is a scientific definition. This is the definition that I kind of pushed myself to create because I, I realized that in writing this book, um, a lot of people talk about storytelling and it just means a million things to a million people. And it, it can kind of just become good communication if you're not careful. Um, and so I said, let me be really precise about what I mean here. So what I mean by a story uh, is a set of characters placed on a stage, you know, a metaphorical stage in which things happen to them in order to illustrate a truth about the way the world works. And ideally, so that the audience member, the person listening to the story says, huh, that could be me. I'm learning something because not only did this happen to this person, but if I was in this situation, it would also happen to me if I made the same choices. So a story is, is, is a stage where things happen to individuals, uh, basically. Now, I say that those, those, the things on the stage are not placed there by chance. They're placed there because the storyteller wants to illustrate a core truth about the world, according to their, their thinking. Um, and that's called the moral of the story, right? And in the old stories, uh, they would actually tell you at the end, like in the old fables, they'll tell you the moral of the story is blah, blah, blah. And so you would just know. But, you know, we're, we're much better at understanding that than being need to, need to be spoon fed it every time. So um, oftentimes the, the, the moral shines through. Now, like there's some postmodern stories where it's very hard to tell what the moral might be. But most of the time, a story will, will feel sort of random and hard to follow if you're not trying to build an argument about how the world works or how human beings behave or how animals behave or whatever. And so those are there to, to illustrate the moral. But the moral itself is really like a carrier for the values that you want to spread. So if you want to tell a story um, and the, the, the moral is he who hesitates is lost, right? So lots and lots of stories are about, you know, big risk, big reward, adventure, you're, you know, you're sharing values about, about those things, about, about courage and bravery and putting yourself out in the world. Um, you may tell a story where the moral is better safe than sorry. And that's a, a very different moral, which is about security and safety. So I think that like the core is the values. Wrapped around it is the moral of the story, the core truth that we can all believe in. And then at the highest level, the most visible level are the characters and the things that illustrate that, that point. That's how to construct a pretty good story almost every time. If you can think about well, what's a core, you know, what, what values do I want to spread? And this is most easy to do with children, by the way. If you're like, I want to teach my kids to, to share and cooperate. Well, those are the values you want. Well, well, what do I know about the world? What happens to people who share and cooperate? What truth do I want to teach them about cooperation? And then, you know, put some rabbits and some foxes on the stage and have them live out these, these tales of what happens when they do cooperate, what happens when they don't. So that's, that's the kind of core of a story, values, moral, and then the characters that, that live through that. And again, you know, it's been called uh, like a reality simulator because we're able to learn from hearing these stories that we don't have to have that experience ourselves to learn those lessons. We get wiser just by hearing the stories and applying them to our own lives. So how is it that stories work? And why do they work? Why, why are they so powerful then? Um, so how they work. Um, again, I would say that we sort of fail to access um, certain parts of, of 
human thought, like, you know, emotional triggers, certain memories, um, identity, when we just work at a logical level of abstraction. Of course, it's a huge thing that humans are able to do is argue at the level of logical abstraction. But it's very rare that a, a, a logical abstract argument will make someone say, that's the core of my identity. You might agree with it, but that doesn't necessarily tap into, again, what I said at the beginning, this sort of tribal feeling that the stories that I cherish and share are the stories that I'll die for, are the stories that I will fight for, are the stories that I think of as me. It's hard to take a logical argument and make that you. You may identify with logic, but it's it's hard to build tribalism around that. And human beings are sort of tribal creatures who um, use stories to say, this is us, this is them, this is why we uh, do these things. Uh, there's a lot of science that says people often try to don't make moral choices based on what they think is right, but make, based more, make, moral, make moral choices based on how do I become that person that I admire? How do I live like the person I admire? And stories actually give us heroes to emulate. Um, like so I what think would Jesus do? Like that's the oh, most yes, common yes. Yeah. example. Well, exactly. Very, very powerful. And it's quite, a, quite a wise way of making your way through the world is, you know, pick a hero. My version is what would Socrates do? That's my yeah. own personal version. There you go. There you go. Perfect. So um, you would only be able to, if Socrates is not just a string of ideas. Socrates is a man that you can look to as a role model. And that's because you've heard his stories. Um, so I think it's very common, especially coming from the broadcast era where it kind of uh, you know, marketers and, and advertisers had this platform that they could just yell at people through. It's very common to just go and list all the things you want people to believe in and just shout at them, here's what you should know. And yet that doesn't make someone say, oh, if I listen to you, I can be the person I want to be. And that only happens through storytelling. Wow. And th that's that's fantastic. And what are the top five markers of a great story then? So I built this system that I call merit just so that I can remember it and others can remember it as well. Um, and I, I think it's powerful because you might, let's say you're using the model that I'm talking about. You might figure out what your moral is. You might know the values you wanna share and you might figure out a way of kind of illustrating that. But now you wanna make sure that it's an, a powerful and good story. So I, I use these five markers because I think that if you apply them to any story, even a really well-told one, you can just keep upping the level of, of power of that story. So the first is that a story needs to be memorable. That means it needs to have elements that someone can latch onto and say, okay, there's an image that comes to me when I think of this story. This is why having characters that are quite unusual looking or speak in strange ways or things that are unexpected happening, you know, those moments that are unforgettable. If there's really like, the story is just kind of here the whole way, it will not be memorable. Things need to stand out as unexpected and our brains are really primed and programmed to look for the unexpected in our environments. So memorable is kind of critical in that way. Uh, emotional, this one's pretty simple, but you know, if it, you don't want people to just think something when they hear your story, you want someone to feel something. This one's actually quite easy to work with because go ahead and tell your story to somebody, ask how it made them feel. If they say, oh, it's kind of hard to say, uh, you're probably not going to get a story that's really landing. If someone said, wow, that made me feel really sad, or wow, I feel really inspired by that story, then you know that you're starting to hit on that level. And then you can ask them, well, what do you remember about the story? And see if they're instantly like, well, I remember the guy with the, with the magic cane. That was crazy. You know, so you go from there. Um, so relatable. Uh, the idea of this one is that you want, as, as, I as I mentioned before, you want someone to hear this story and say, hey, that could be me. That's a character I can relate to. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, you know you need to pander to your audiences and make someone that looks exactly like the person who's listening with the same background. But this is why um, in the hero's journey, which maybe we'll talk about later, the character, the, the hero is not like the the king or queen with all the power. The hero is an ordinary person who does extraordinary things. And one of the most easy ways to make a relatable story is is make someone that starts off their life in a similar place to where your audiences are gonna be, normal people who, who eventually can do special things. Um, immersive is the, uh, is the next one. And this one's actually, I think, quite simple too. Adding details that make the person feel like they're there, you know, sights, sounds, smells, 
those little details that make you not just stay at this level of uh, high level moving through a plot, but actually jump diving into that world. Um, really, again, it kind of helps with the emotion, it helps with the memorability, and it's just kind of a little trick, you know, well, well, if this person walked into a bar, you know, what's, what sound was playing? If this person, you know, father was shot, you know, what did the gunpowder smell like when he was standing there as a child? Those things bring us into that scene. And uh, finally, tangible, um, I like to discourage people from jumping out of their story into some, suddenly into some kind of omnipotent or omniscient, sorry, some kind of omniscient view where you're no longer at, at the ground level. You're now like in some, making some broad claims. And a lot of times when we tell stories, we'll be like in the world of the characters and then suddenly we'll kind of forget and just say something we want people to believe and we jump out of that. And so just being careful that things happen at the human scale because that's where relatability and immersiveness can happen. So I use that merit thing. Um, like I said, it's, it's really not that hard to just say, all right, I love the story I'm telling here. It's going great. How do I make it one notch more relatable? Or is there anything I can do to immerse people in this story? And just change one sentence. And you know, you're just climbing that ladder to better and better um, storytelling when you use those tools, I find. Yeah, exactly. So, so maybe merit are actually kind of like the benchmark, the benchmarks with, with, with which we kind of measure or evaluate if we're able to tell a story that lands, a story that connects, a story that makes a difference, that has a likelihood of spreading, you know, of connecting to people and of hopefully going viral like you did with your videos. And then the hero's journey is the actual process or structure behind the story. Yeah, I think, I think that works. Um, I would say, you know, don't start writing your story with the merit. You know, it's, that's kind of for editing, I would say, or for improvement. You know, you need to build your build your foundation and then you can use those five markers to kind of level up. So you start with the hero's journey then and you finish with uh, with the merit system to look at that hero's journey and see if it actually seems to work. Yeah, I think that would be a good way to, to say it. Yeah. Um, so before we jump into the hero's journey, I'll say, um, you know, in the years, it's been 10 years now since maybe 12 years since I wrote that book. Um, you know, I've learned, I've learned a lot and learned that there are other patterns and limitations of the hero's journey. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of criticism these days of the hero's journey in that it's a somewhat individualistic hero who saves the world. And I think a lot of the problems that we now see are very difficult for individuals to actually impact. And uh, I think that all makes sense. Uh, at the same time, I, I've seen time and again how screenwriters in Hollywood, how advertisers, how TED, TED talkers, how you know everyone who really wants to be heard should be aware of and masterful with this story template. And then you can use others to layer on top of it. So I don't want to say it's the kind of panacea, uh, you know, for every possible story. But I do think it's, it's, it's just kind of 101 that we need to understand it and know how to use it and we can kind of build from there. So Hero's Journey works like this. Uh, you've got Joseph Campbell, this mythologist who had this question, um, why, you know, are there, are there stories that have, you know, existed throughout cultures and throughout times? What is the pattern that all cultures have shared? Because he was, you know, studying all of these and starting to sense this pattern. And when he really dove into it, he came forth with what he felt was this story template. And like I said before, you know, George Lucas, when he was stuck trying to write his space opera, called Joseph Campbell, was like, hey, I'm stuck, what should I do? And Campbell was like, you know, use this. And George Lucas, you know, used the, every step of Campbell's hero's journey uh, to write Star Wars. And, and you can see it's like, People are fanatic about that story. And, you know, why was that? Well, he was using this very simple, powerful template. So here's how the hero's journey works. Um, it starts with, with an outsider. This could be like an orphan or a hobbit or a person, an old frail person. Somebody who is living in a world that is not great, that they feel there's something deeply wrong in this world. And they think they're probably the last person who can do something about it. Right. So, you know, Cinderella is, you know, sweeping ashes off the, you know, um, the hearth or, you know, Frodo is three feet tall or whatever. You know, you're, you're, you're small and you're powerless. And this person is kind of muddling their way through the world. And they have this choice to sort of stay with, accept their fate. But some part of them is, is calling for something more. And I think we can all, you know, about relatability, I think a lot of us can relate to that, right? We, we see the world as not the way we wish it could be, and we see there's maybe something more we can do, but we doubt we have power to do anything about it. 
And then one day they meet a new person. This, this important new person enters their lives. And this character is called the mentor. So um, this is someone who is, appears almost out of nowhere and tells this hero to be that they have a special place in, the, in destiny. So this could be Obi-Wan Kenobi. This is the fairy godmother. In the story of uh, Moses and Exodus, uh, this is God coming from the burning bush saying, you know, you have a great destiny. Now, what happens when this, hap when this first happens is the person says like, oh, you've got the wrong person. I think, I think you found the wrong person here. That, that's not me, right? Moses is like uh, 80 years old and stutters. So he's like, how am I going to go and free the slaves and no one will listen to me? And I'm an old man. And I've already fled from uh, the world and, and hidden myself in, in the hills. You know, Luke Skywalker is a weak teenager. Um, so what, one thing that always happens is that the hero says like, you, I'm not going to do that. That's really not me. Um, you know, we see this with like Neo being this kind of loser programmer guy who's just like expecting, who, you know, hates the corporate world, but really doesn't think he can do anything about it. And then the, the mentor does a couple of things. One, the mentor says, um, I'm not going to let you just go in there and be killed. I'm going to teach you what you need to know, and I'm going to give you some kind of magic gift. And so oftentimes the magic gift is some, one of the most memorable parts of the story. It's the lightsaber, it's the ruby red slippers, it's Moses' staff. Uh, the red uh, pill. Yeah, and the red pill is uh, yeah, definitely a gift of the mentor. And so the, the hero says, okay, yeah, let me try it, basically. I, I'm inspired, so let's go. And then the mentor shocks the hero by saying, well, actually, I'm not really coming with you. You're going to have to do this on your own. And, and sometimes the mentor comes a little away, but then the mentor gets killed. The mentor disappears. You know, Gandalf falls into the pit. Uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi allows himself to be killed. And so now the hero is sort of on their own, and they've stepped into this magic world. And in this magic world, talk about memorable, everything is different. And one of the first things they realize when they get into this world, this is Jack climbing the beanstalk, is you find out, oh, this is why the world was broken. There's a bad guy. There's a dragon that's doing this. The giant is kind of destroying our, our town, and that's why we're so poor. And they start to put two and two together and say, oh, there's really, I understand now what the source of the world's problem is. And they go deeper and deeper into this world. Maybe they make friends along the way, and then they confront the dragon in the end. And they use everything that they've learned the whole time. Um, and they use the magic gift to slay the dragon against all odds, and steal the treasure that the dragon's been holding. Now this treasure is, you know, the audience thrills to see that the treasure has been, been seized. Um, but when the hero brings it back to the regular world, this treasure is not something that makes them rich and famous or gives them extraordinary power. It's something that they use to heal the world. And somehow the, the journey and the gift that is given for, for winning is not winning a lottery, but serving one's fellow human and making the world better. And so they come back and oftentimes people don't even believe the journey existed. They, they don't get that glory. They don't get that personal aggrandizement. They just get to serve the world that they once felt was broken. And then they, you know, maybe there's a sequel or maybe they just kind of fade into being a happy old person. Um, so why do we listen to these stories? Why are they important? How could somebody possibly use such a complicated story in order to tell their own stories? Um, you know, long answer to a short question, but some of these things are very important. Like, why do we listen to these stories? Well, um, and why, why is it in our DNA to want to hear these stories? Well, Campbell said that, imagine there are tribes in which the young people um, of the tribe who are full of energy and wanting to do something um, are not taught how to be valued member, valuable members to that society. They're not taught to channel their energies into serving the tribe. Instead, they channel their energies into self-aggrandizement. Uh, they're going to not be a very cohesive tribe. But the ones where they find out that to be a hero is to do the right thing and live their deepest values in service of the tribe, that's going to work. Uh, the stories in which a young person believes that they have a special role to play within the tribe is going to create leadership and cohesion. So essentially, we all want to hear that we have a place in the community. We all want to hear that we can live our deepest values. Uh, we all have a yearning to live our deepest values. And we all want to hear that normal people can do extraordinary things. So um, I would say one of the lessons of this, even if you don't use all the steps of the hero's journey, and I only included probably six of the you know, 13 or so that are often used, normal person listens to their heart and does extraordinary things is a, that's, that's hero's journey right there. Um, 
they resist the temptations to, to, to live the normal life. They set out on their own and they, they learn how to serve the world better. And so I found this really exciting because I felt that um, in my own journey of serving causes and serving things I most cared about, this kind of provided a sense that if we tell stories about the things we most believe in and care about that serve the world, those are the things that people want to hear about. People don't really want to hear so much some of these assumptions that we have about marketing that like this sneaker will make you rich and famous, this, this, this makeup, you're not good enough, but this makeup will make you beautiful. Yeah, that does work. But that's like the template for how we do all of our marketing and advertising. And we really are missing this opportunity. I call it empowerment marketing to help people look internally to their, their highest values and make our audiences the heroes of the story rather than the brands themselves, the heroes of the story. And so I put this idea out there in 2010. I think a huge amount of it has actually happened in which we now no longer expect the voices of the people who are reaching out to us to be talking about how heroic they are, but trying to heroicize their audiences. It's not always used for good, but um, I do think that shift has really happened. And that was the shift I was really calling for in the book. So, um, yeah, I, I think we'd have to do a whole hour just on how to leverage the hero's journey, but hopefully in that answer, just get the sort of sense of how to begin to think about normal person meets an extraordinary mentor. In the book, I say, like, if you're, if you're a marketer or communicator, you're that mentor. You're calling people to their highest values and what magic gift are you giving them to make them live their best lives or enable them to live their best lives? Um, you know, thank you for starting the hero's journey. That's very well said because... Again, as you pointed out, stories give us a meaning, stories give us a purpose, stories give us a community, stories give us a status. But here's the problem with that, though. Don't stories lead us to sort of a moral or cultural relativism then? Because let's say you have a story of being vegetarian, and let's say I have a story of being uh, a meat uh, producing, uh, large scale uh, meat farm producer. Uh, and so, you know, you've told your story, then I'm going to come and tell another story. And, you know, if I've done my job right, and if I follow all those uh, elements that you shared with us, you know, the farmer who cuts out, you know, the land out of this useless desert wilderness and then turns it into the heaven where you know animals flourish and plants flourish and you know the person who takes care of the land and the traditions that come with that and how it goes from one generation of the family into, uh, into the other and sort of like this kind of pioneering spirit of turning the desert into the heaven and, you know, doing it all with your own two hands and, and how John Locke said, you know, uh, property is that which has admixed with your own sweat uh, uh, during your own hard labor and all that stuff, which is kind of part of the, the American dream and the American pioneering spirit, you know, from the first settlers and then eventually to the waves going all the way to the west, to the California and, and also even even that sort of like gold rush spirit you know all of this uh put together so there's a lot of mythology with those you know so uh, uh and, and of course pushing back to that you have the stories and the mythology which disappeared which was surrounded with the indigenous peoples whether in canada or whether in in the united states it's pretty much the, the same stories uh and, and it's a story of genocide to a great degree and and so the question is doesn't if if all of us have their own stories and the right to their own stories and presuming we tell them in the best way possible and we live them in the best way possible, what happens when those stories are mutually incompatible? Right now we have the story of uh, global warming, uh, you know, uh, told by, you know, a lot of people and you have a lot of other people who have a different kind of a story where... What we call the evidence and or the science in support of global warming doesn't quite fit within their story. And so therefore they easily dismiss or claim it is irrelevant or on, the, on their value scale or moral scale, not as important, not among the top high priorities for them. 
for them, things like, let's say, jobs and the economy and all those things take priority, take precedence. What do we do in a situation where that as as those and don't doesn't that leave lead us all to cultural relativism? Yeah. So um, I guess I'm, I wouldn't say that storytelling is a pathway to uh, adjudicating the tr truth. Um, that storytelling is a skill that um, we anyone who wants to be heard must have. Um, I think there's been an imbalance, in, in my opinion, there's been an imbalance in which those with a lot of money and who don't have science on their side, uh, and this is my opinion here, but let's, you know, look at climate change. If you don't have science on your side and you've got a ton of oil money, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to hire the people who know how to tell the best damn stories in the world and they're going to win. Now, if you do have science on your side and not a lot of money, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to spend all your money on science. And then you're going to go and wave your, you know, scientific papers around and you're going to get crushed by the story. I mean, we are in this world now where like climate change is not just something we debate about. It's happening, you know, like it, my state is burning and we're still in this weird spin and cycle. So if I could take storytelling out of, if I could take storytelling out of the human mind and make us perfectly, perfectly rational creatures, be an interesting thought experiment. I don't know what would happen to the world, but it would be interesting, right? And this is a question that we look at when we think about AI, right? Like, well, will wouldn't AI... that turn us into robots? That's what yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah, like, yeah. Take so, the stories so, yeah. out of our minds. We be, we become like zombies. We be, become like robots. Right. So we have this unfortunate situation where we are influenceable by stories that can be untrue, but it's also core to who we are. My my sense is that by doing the work that I've done. I want to give those scientists and those people without the resources, but with truth on their side, as I see it, uh, the ability to use the same tools that the uh, those who wish to kind of obfuscate the truth are, are expert at using and have been using forever. So um, it's, you know, storytelling will not uh, solve the problem of a post-truth world. But if the people who most people who are authentic don't think to tell stories because they think just by being authentic, they'll be heard, they can really be empowered by understanding this logic that's understood by those who don't have truth on their side. Yeah, but the problem is that, let's say, Donald Trump, you got to give him the credit. He's a very authentic guy. Uh, so, uh, and by the way, relatively speaking, at least that's my opinion, he's very authentic in the sense that he has the guts to be who he is in public and throw fits and do all kind of what I would call moronic behavior, but he's not ashamed to do it and that's kind of like an asset for him for his audience and compared to let's say someone like Hillary Clinton he had a very good story on his own uh, side you know let's make America great again you know my wife's family half of my wife's family is from Rochester New York and Rochester used to be play this place called Kodak City because for a hundred years Kodak was among the most prosperous companies in America and then it went bankrupt. And after Kodak went bankrupt, it's a devastation. Like Rochester is, is like Detroit City. It's it's half dead. Downtown Rochester is, is like a at best a, a mere shadow of what it used to be. And so that story of let's make America great again connected incredibly well with my wife's family. And so the vast majority of them voted voted for him. And so my, my and there's endless other examples like, uh, you know, you have certain kind of conscience which prevented you from taking the job offered to you by the, the meat producing industry. But people, many equally gifted stories like you told the story of the Marlboro man that you tell or uh, other stories that prevent us today to to deal with you know the the pop the 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 soft drink industry or the fast food industries which are at the core uh, of America's obesity epidemic and the diabetes epidemic right and so when you have equally gifted as you do equally gifted storytellers on on both sides of of, of the spectrum telling incompatible stories the the net effect of that is like yes you're doing a great job but the net effect is how do we resolve this kind of in like unresolved is it resolvable kind of conflict or differences what to 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 actually move somewhere to make to 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 end up to some kind of a conclusive reality at least or something 
Yeah. Uh, before I answer the question, I, I think that you are, in, the, in two examples you gave, you might be confounding or equating uh, skillfulness with authenticity. Because I think that what you're saying about the, the, the story, the hypothetical story that you're telling of that connects to the American West and connects to pioneers, connects to John Locke uh, about farming, that's skillful. Connecting to patterns of thought that run deep in our society, connecting a story to those patterns of thought is skillful communication. Uh, it's not authentic because uh, when you go to a factory farm, you don't have individual farmers through their sweat and blood partnering with plants and animals to create a farm like you just but the ads the yeah. ads that you see on tv know, they do tell you that they do tell you that but let's but like there there is a reality that you can you yes you can say anything and you can say something skillfully it may not be at all true and i would say the same thing about you know we don't want to go too far into politics but like i say the same thing about donald trump to call him authentic when he's spewing lies in every sentence is a, is a strange twist on reality that we now live right he's authentically skillful in that he understands how to throw out the playbook i'm repeating the words of my family that voted <laughs> yeah. for him yeah they, yeah, find, I he, I they find him authentic right. not me they right, think right. he's well, an honest honest person in contrast to all the do those damn politicians in washington sure, sure. well i think that like there, there's something nihilistic in the very fact that because someone he doesn't even say what he thinks. I think he knows. There's another track in his mind that knows what he actually thinks. He doesn't care for the rules. He's a, you know, he's a rebel who doesn't care about the rules is basically the thing. But that it's interpreted as just saying what really he believes, I think, and that, that somehow that is authentic is a, is a sort of par problem of this post-truth world where, you know, the veneer of, of you know, truth, what, what it... Uh, Colbert called, you know, truthiness, it sounds right, is, is a sort of replace, replacement for truthfulness. Um, I think you're, you're asking a question that uh, is, I think we're all trying to deal with in this social media world. I kind of hinted at this in the beginning, which was I said that like, I thought the internet might be a liberatory kind of fantastical utopian tool by which the people would rise up and share the truth over what the gatekeepers maybe were holding back from us. And I think we've kind of gotten into the mirror image of that, where in some ways the, the rich and powerful or companies are benefiting from amplifying non-truth and we're all kind of complicit in it. Um, I don't believe that, you know, the, the topic that we're talking about today, storytelling will resolve this, this issue. Um, but I think that the, you know, I'm, I'm currently working, uh, with uh, Tristan Harris and the Center for Humane Technology uh, to help with their with their work and their stories, um, you know these folks are trying to get that raise the level of attention on what social platforms are doing for us, doing to us as a society. And again, it's important that people like that understand and have the power of storytelling to fight that battle, which I think is probably one of the most important battles of our time. But it will be resolved on that battlefield, which will be you know which will be empowered by storytelling. Um, but not, I don't think we can just have a sort of battle of stories in which truth will prevail. Because I think if you look back through human history, you'll find that stories have been used to send nations and tribes into warfare with each other, in which both sides equally believed and were willing to lay, you know, lay down their lives for the stories they believed in. And you know, there was no way for any third party to say which was true. Um, and I think we even live in a world where like, the very notion of truth or science or objectivity has been rejected. So like, it's impossible to even establish on what grounds we would say there's truth between sides that are more committed to their own. Okay, so uh, we touched on the uh, danger of cultural rel relativism in general, but let's talk a little bit about the the impact of stories as we know them a little bit further and maybe a little bit along those lines still with a quote from Jonathan Gottschall's most recent book, uh, which is called The Storytelling Paradox, how our love of storytelling builds societies and tears them down. And in the book, uh, Jonathan says, quote, story science reveals that everything good about story is the same as everything bad. 
So to get good people to behave monstrously, you must first tell them a story. So the real question for Jonathan Gocho in his book is, how can we save the world from stories? Because for him, one of the things that he can see and, and maybe we can see too, is that maybe the world currently is being destroyed by the diversity and the the kind of the the vehement uh, sort of uh, embracing of mutually incompatible stories by you know different parts of our civilization that are getting in a sort of a more and more aggressive and even violent attacks on each other. So it's not giving us a positive spin or take on, on story and its impact on our civilization right now. So what, what do you tell people like Jonathan who, who, who have this kind of concern? Mm. Well, I mean, I, I, would, I would agree. Like I think I said at the beginning, uh, stories tell us who we are, you know, stories help with us versus them, right? Stories tell us who we are, who they are. Uh, they identify the villain in a, in a story. They give us a, a reason to cohere and reasons to cohere are also reasons to fight and to reasons to die. Uh, I don't think that anybody has ever been able to influence anybody to get on the battlefield except by pointing a gun at their head and say, go fight, or by telling them a story that's going to get them whipped up enough to commit, you know, all kinds of atrocities that they would never commit uh, to the, on their own tribe members. Um, so I definitely don't disagree. Uh, and as we started to begin to touch on this conversation earlier, you know, you get into sort of AI ethics when you think about, well, how would we want machines to behave and what would we want them to take of human, you know, would we want to base our ethical machines on human ethics and human behaviors, or would we want them to transcend that? And how do you even get out of that sort of like paradox of what is the best of human values and what are, what's the worst and how do you, support, you know, separate those two things? Um, so I would say, Jonathan's argument is right that these that stories can tear our part tear our world apart. And now that we have instant communication to be able to um, for all these stories to come into contact with each other at all moments and all times, we're in an unprecedented world where the whole idea of the story wars is you know has been ramped up in the last since I wrote that book you know a hundredfold. Um, I don't know what his prescription is. I haven't read the book, and I'm not really sure what I can even say. I I, I would say that I agree that. You know, I'm not a I'm not a evangelist for storytelling. As the more storytelling that we have, the better humanity will be. I'm more of an evangelist for finding the people that I think are telling the best stories or have the best stories to tell the most authentic stories to tell the values that need to spread about a more unified humanity um, and helping them to make sure that those stories get out there. But I think that there is a valuable lesson in what you're saying. Whereas like when we engage in the battle and in the fight and throw more noise in, even if we're on the side of right, that we can be inadvertently just ramping up the, the story wars to be more and more uh, runaway. And so we have to think about very strategically, how do we spread stories that don't just create more culture wars, that don't just villainize the other side and pull us away from any hope of, um, of moving forward as a civilization. I do think, you know, I, I'm influenced uh, by the work of Jonathan Haidt and, you know, his work on moral uh, tastes and understanding where are where the morality of conservatives and progressives overlap, how to understand. And this is where I think going to those core values and saying, like, what are those core values that all humans share and how do we leverage them to make to see our see our similarities more than our differences? is a valuable way of doing this. How can conservatives understand progressive values? How can progressives understand conservative values to band together against our true kind of common enemies, which is not each other? Um, I think that's a very important and valuable work for the next generation of storytelling. Um, but I really don't wanna say that I have a solution to the problem that you're putting out there because I, I don't know that anybody does. And I'm curious what your solution is, if any, uh, to this quandary. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll we'll come back to my solution a little bit, or or search for it anyway, a little bit later in the conversation. But so your proposal is basically look for the overlap, look for the common space uh, between the right and the left, for example, uh, or the any two potential sides uh, uh, around a, a potential story conflict or story war, as you call it. Look for the overlap and try to make build upon that foundation. Which is which is a, a good suggestion, 
pre presuming that there is any space of overlap. Uh, so I think there's, there's clearly overlap in human values, which is like the core, the lower, the lowest level of what's going on, how those values are interpreted and what clothing they wear and how they're played out. That's, there's not, there's not a lot of that. But if you can bring people together, and I think there's good, there's good science about this as well, bring people together in one-on-one -on -one contact into conversation with one another, they often will find that they share common values and they share common beliefs. It's just that when we get into these filter bubbles, it's harder and harder for us to, to see the common values that underlie our very different assumptions about what should be done about them. Right, but here's the problem. For example, when you don't have common values, so, so think about it this way. Uh, and I wanted to bring this back a little bit later in our conversation, but maybe now would be the better time. Anyway, so my book is concerned with the, the human story, the story that has brought us thus far. And I entirely agree with what you say on page 58. I actually had reached that conclusion about five years before I read your book. Uh, and, and I just didn't have the same name that you have there, but I was blown away. Um, and... and that was the diagnosis that I made for our civilization after doing, you know, 250 interviews with quote, the brightest and the best scientists from a diversity of field. Um, and you say on page 58, the space between the realities of our moment in history and the shared stories to which we turn for explanation, meaning and instruction for action are what you call a myth gap. And, and that was the problem that I diagnosed uh, myself. In my view, just like yours, stories uh, are, are uh, basically like instruction manuals. They tell us who we are, where we're coming from, where we're going, what is right, what is wrong, what is to be done and what is not to be done, how we should and should not live our lives and where we're going from here. So stories inform not only our past and our present, but the action we should take with respect to the future. And our stories that have been very powerful and have brought us thus far are now failing to continue providing that function into our current moment. They're literally for falling apart. Uh, and so you call it this the myth gap, which is a brilliant way to, to say it. And, and that's one of many reasons why I actually love your book. Uh, so much. And by the way, you wrote this before I came up with the idea. The only problem is I discovered it much later once I started digging into doing that research. So good on you for that. Uh, but, but here's the problem. So our greatest strength is also our greatest weakness. Uh, and so the human story that we've had so far has been the most powerful tool that humanity has had. Um, Literary critic Kenneth Burke says that stories are a tool for living. Uh, and so the human story has brought us this thus far. But here's the problem. So, and we, we, we can have many names on the human story, which has been written and rewritten several times. Probably the last time when the human story was rewritten was around the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, the Industrial Revolution, kind of those centuries. Um, and we have humanism, for a lack of better word, to call our story. And I go into my book proposal uh, about four potential uh, elements that human, the story of humanism consists of. The first one is the story of progress, mm -hmm. which is uh, whether you take the theological uh, origins of our human story or the scientific theory of evolution, we, we kind of start with these uh, animalistic origins, and then we transcend them. That's who we are. So we have this kind of upward mo motion, whether in the theological sense or in the evolutionary biological sense. The second element is that, therefore, we have the story of supremacy and centrality of humanity, whether, in, again, in the theological sense, because we are a reflection of God and his first creation, and the world has been created as our garden, therefore ours for the taking, or in the evolutionary biology sense, as we are the smartest species on our planet. The same conclusion. The third element of, of the human story is the story of our separation from nature. Are we a part of the world or are we apart from the world? And so far we are kind of disengaging or alienating ourselves uh, from, from that nature. And then the final part of our human story is the story of becoming gods because that's what the Bible says, 
uh, you know, with the second coming of, of the prophet. And also that's what modern uh, I, uh, stories like transhumanism promises, that the science of immortality uh, and the merging of men and of machine would give us this kind of biological immortality, whether through genetic engineering, whether through mind uploading, whether through, um, you know, human enhancement in one form, shape or another. And so anyway, that's, that's kind of the story so far. Now imagine the AIs. And our story, by the way, has given us a blank check to do with the world whatever we want to do. That's why every year we kill 73 billion animals and about 1.2 trillion aquatic organisms. Now imagine we are confronted with another storyteller called AI or aliens from space. And of course, they're going to have their own story and their story would not be called humanism, but would be called AIism or alienism. And so they're going to be the heroes of their own story and they would be the center and the reflection of their gods. And in that case, we don't have any overlapping space between our stories, but we may need to find a way to peacefully coexist, whether with AIs, whether with transhumans, whether with animal uplift, whether with aliens from space, potentially. Let's say hypothetically, but probably the AIs and the human uploads and the transhumans may be the highest probability of, of those possibilities. And so you, unless we transcend and change our own story with the deliberate design to create space for those, we are not going to have any overlap because they become mutually exclusive. One is AIism, the other is humanism. And that's it. That means war. You're touching on issues that I've been exploring a lot since uh, since writing my book, and I'm, I'm fascinated by by many of the things that you're looking at. And I do agree uh, with a lot of the things that you're saying. Um, we have this linear. We love these linear views of of history, which is what you know I call the progress narrative, and what you're talking about, and this sort of progressivism, this idea. Uh, probably going back to, to Plato and this ideal of, idea of ideal forms that somehow the world is polluted and we can get to this ideal place and we're closer and closer to crafting it and the human brain can sort of turn the world into, and this goes to the story that you're coming up with about, you're, you're pointing to with farming, like we can cultivate the world into a thing that we can then control and that, and that, that goes back obviously to, to the Bible and to uh, the Garden of Eden. And the epitome of this is Ray Kurzweil's idea that the, 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 the universe is moving from less towards more intelligence, highly teleological concept, and the ultimate, and he has these stages of evolution, where in the ultimate stage of the evolution, we have these giant computroniums, yeah. matryoshka brains, uh, smart dust, and finally, the final stage, as Ray Kurzweil says, the universe wakes up. Right, right. Well, the universe may already be awake uh, and may be un, unawakened by us taking every atom in it to, to create a giant computer. Um, but this is a, this, this kind of, I think that this kind of linear view in which, and you know, every, every civilization have, have called themselves the people to so one way or another, that they are the sort of chosen people. They are the, um, the, the, the necessary outcome of all that's come before. And then all those civilizations are gone and wiped away. Um, those civilizations in, in being wiped away did not destroy the very substrate of life on earth. And so they were able to take, get off stage without you know, destroying the planet um, or the, the galaxy, if, if Kurzweil gets his way or the universe. Um, so I think that we do need to get out of this this linear view of history. I, I recently read The Dawn of Everything. I don't know if you've, if you've gotten to read it yet, uh, the new David Graeber book, but really it looks at, really critiques that entire way of seeing and, and really says how societies that have come before us have had equal, they haven't been on a conveyor belt to this moment. They've had equal or more political imagination than we've had, than we have at this point in this moment. And this sense that we're stepping up this ladder is is, is terrifying and, and also creates a, a lack of self-reflectiveness of where we want to go. Um, I think the progress narrative also tells us in its more recent form in the more Steven Pinker form that like the, the capitalism, science, um, 
and humanism are the drivers of all things that have occurred positively, which is also very simplified. And, you know, in, in the dawn of everything, they really talk about how the Europeans, the Enlightenment was likely sparked by European contact with indigenous societies in the, in, in the New World, where the Americans, the indigenous people, had senses of freedom and actually had better oratory than the French who were trying to work, you know, and, and eventually they, they introduced ideas of liberty to, to Europe, which was anathema to the European experiment at the time. So we, we get to this place where we have a very egotistical sense of our centrality in the universe and a, in the centrality of our own tribes, which creates all these problems. And I, I think your point is, is great, which is that if we create new creatures, new beings that are superior to us because, they, because they're you know, brilliant AIs, and they carry that same sense that we carry, they will simply sweep us away as you know, a nice stepping stone on the pathway to their own supremacy. And you know, humanism becomes you know, the dataism that Yuval Harari talks about. And we really do have no place. And if that's how we want to go, if we want to create these machines to replace us, and then they have their own sense of superiority, we can keep on this path, um, but this is the path that we're clearly on, and that our that our children, these new these new creatures or these new sentient beings, will take if we program them with the same attitude that we have now. But you're asking, like, how, well, how does storytelling get us out of this post-truth world? Now you're asking and prescribing the storytelling might get us out of like the deepest cultural assumptions that we currently have, and that's you know hopefully your book is a is a contribution to that. Uh, but it's one of the most difficult things to possibly undo. Um, I think it was only a few years ago that I understood the problem of humanism because humanism brings with it so many of the ethical things that we cherish and individual, the, 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 the sanctity of the individual and the sanctity of every human life is so important for all the human rights and all the things that we, that we cherish. And yet in its very name, humanism puts hum, human beings at the He's center a species. of the spe spe speciesism, which is, which is self-destructive. Even if all you care about is humans, we can't survive with that kind of speciesism. Of I course. Think that's what we are. So, yeah, I can't wait to read your book. It sounds fascinating. <laughs> well, here's the problem with my book, though, my friend. Uh, so, I, I got so the book is three parts. The first part is story, where it explains how story works. Uh, and I've, uh, I have sort of a lot of material and a lot of references to your own work in that part. The second part is our story where I talk about the human story. So I take it from the level of abstraction to the specific level of our story. And then the third part is our future story or the future story. And so I've done the work and the research and it's, I'm ready to, you know, bury myself somewhere and write part one and part two, but I'm really struggling with part three. And so these conversations are sort of uh, designed to hopefully spur, uh, can, first to motivate me to keep going and secondly hopefully help me in one way or another to to kind of get through the struggle because while I have some ideas I still am very far from what that future story should be or or is uh, and so it, and it may be absolutely arrogant and, and ridiculous of me to presume that I can even possibly ever come up with that story on my own but at least with this, if I can spark a conversation so that maybe others can come up with that story, uh, then uh, if I can serve the function that Socrates served, which is to say being a midwife to other people, giving birth to their own best ideas, then I think that's a, a job not bad done. Uh, but still, I, I, I'm committed and, and I will continue searching for that and kind of tweaking it and working in it for as long as I can. The only thing is I can't put a timeline on it because... Uh, I may never actually, it's, it's a pretty lofty goal, maybe an impossible one, as you pointed out. And so, but I, I know I'm committed for it. So even if it takes the rest of my life, but I, I don't know how it's going to uh, work out. The only thing I can say is that I appreciate the help that your work and other people like you have provided to get me where I am. And if I'm lucky enough to build a little bit upon it, then I think uh, maybe not Maybe even your work wouldn't be wasted because that means that you threw a stone in the water, which created a ripple, uh, so that I threw my own stone in the water, and then hopefully the ripple grew, and so on and so on. Uh, yeah, let me let me just say that uh, 
I I find a lot of rich territory in a kind of uh, maybe a maligned and dismissed story from the past, um, you know, which is the, the whole Gaia theory, because I think it's been wrapped in a bit of like more of a hippie kind of approach. But the, the scientific concept that the earth is and behaves like an organism um, and that it create it has many of the same features of an organism, sort of self-healing, self um reproducing within its own kind of closed system it's got this sort of uh, a membrane that keeps that keeps the inside and outside separate that it uses um it's its own that, that life creates the conditions for life i think all of those pieces are very rich territory and like in choosing to call it gaia theory and in the way that it's been adopted by um yeah by a more sort of like 60s and 70s hippie kind of commune feel, I think it's easily dismissed. But I think science is showing us more and more how complex systems do behave and how the earth behaves like an organism and that there's something within that uh, and there's some truth to it, right? We can't live without that sub substrate that upon which we depend and we can't just go to Mars and make a new one, probably. Um, so I, I, I look to that story as a, as a kind of fertile ground for, for new ideas. And, you know, Cam, Campbell said that before he died, that like the only story that matters now is a story about the whole planet and everybody on it. Um, so, you know, if you follow that white rabbit, I think that there is something in that world. And so I'm not sure where you're, where you're taking it, but, um, but I find that that's just an interesting doorway. To Definitely. Through. That's one of the rabbits I'm following because that story has many strengths, uh, most notably the fact, the fact that it's not human centric that it doesn't put us at the pinnacle of evolution. Because my original starting point 10 years ago was the, the story of transhumanism as a potential story of our future. And then it took me, unfortunately, way too long, maybe four or five years, years of investigating the story of transhumanism before I actually realized that it's not the story of the future for a number of reasons. And it's actually a dangerous story to the future. And it actually may lead us to suicide, uh, civilizational wide suicide. Uh, instead of saving us. Um, so, so and, and the Gaia story has many, many benefits. Uh, now, I don't think it's sufficient in its current version, and I don't think it works in the current version because it hasn't worked uh, in the past. It's not been sufficient to, uh, to go viral, to spread sufficiently enough to make it that shift in consciousness which we need. So it hasn't connected at that level and so it at the very least needs to to be like revamped and reworked yeah. i would just say uh, it's, a, it's a it's a thread to pull on more than anything 100 percent, and especially since that idea that the circle is growing you know it used to be first white males of property owning that were like the people in the center then it became all males then it became women then it became other races and now hopefully we're going to be able to put animals within the circle of concern and other sentiences, whether AIs or aliens, etc., and just sort of like grow that circle uh, so that hopefully we find a way to peacefully coexist. But uh, time is advancing here, Jonas. So, so let me ask you, perhaps, or try to, to bring us back on topic a little bit more here with the way that storytelling plays in our relationship with technology in general and maybe artificial in artificial intelligence in particular. So I already mentioned kind of like my take on the, the potential for uh, our relationship with AI, but what's in general your own take about the way that story playing, uh, the, the way that storytelling plays with respect to technology in general and artificial intelligence in particular? Well, there are, I guess, two ways to look at it, two angles to come at it from. And I think one we've, we've already sort of touched on, which is like, what is the human story and how does the, do the creations that we're making advance that story? And you know, what part of, what is the next chapter? Because this, we are clearly on the precipice, very close to the precipice of the next chapter. And with what ethics and with what principles do we want to design our companions or whatever the AI becomes? Um, I think there's another question about very specifically about storytelling and AI. I've had the opportunity to work with GPT-3 and a number of uh, applications built upon it. Um, and it's really fascinating how facile AI already is like right now. 
at telling superior stories, at persuasion, at creating art, you know, at, at understanding, basically observing how humans like to communicate and imitating that, you know, you know almost perfectly in many ways. Um, you can get a, you can get GPT-3 to write in the style of, or even create art in the style of an individual that you want to emulate. And so um, what I think where Campbell had to sit there in his study, slowly looking at all these different cultures and make finding the pattern. I, I think AI, whether it's here today, which I think it is, or it's gonna be here in a year, can study how humans interact with each other and emulate it, you know, can find the patterns that we can't even see ourselves and emulate those patterns and use them to do whatever the owner of the AI, at this point, you know, humans are more in control of AI than the other way around, but somebody who wants to tell a powerful story can use AI to try 100,000 versions of it in an instant, to see what works and then build upon it. Like when we talk about the merit situation, the merit tools of slowly improving your story, it can iter an AI can iterate 100,000 times on a story to see what, what's, what's working. So I think we actually have to become better as people in really questioning and looking at these, the, our own, what stories we take in, how we believe stories, what we, how we allow them to mold our identity, because I think we're, gonna, we're going to see very soon data created stories that are incredibly per persuasive and influential and are going to try that that are going to constantly be trying to change our identities constantly trying to change our allegiances and we're going to be swimming in them and you know already social media feeds are full of inauthentic troll farm you know uh content that's trying to sway us well more and more bots are just going to be creating those things in, in powerful ways so that should change you know, so much of how of, of loving stories is believing that there was a human being behind that story who we identify with. Um, I think less and less there will be humans behind the stories that we're being fed, and um, we're going to need to learn to deal with that. Well, okay, so so let me get one one sort of point of clarity here, though, because I think there may be some some kind of disagreement here that the two of us are, or at least that I'm discovering that we have, and that is, I have these kind of two. AI Turing tests uh, proposals. And the first one is what I would call the Socratic test of AI. And that would be, can AI ask good questions? Because, you know, we know that computers can give us great answers, but I believe still to this day, they're utterly idiotic of actually asking any decent questions in a, and especially questions that, that matter. But the moment that they are able to start asking better questions uh, would be to me a, a huge benchmark of, of kind of artificial intelligence development. And so that's what I call the first step or the first uh, Socratic test of AI. And then my second uh, test for AI, uh, Turing test for AI in a way, would be what I would call to be the, the story test. And the story test is, can the AIs tell a good story? Because obviously the day an AI can tell a sophisticated story, uh, that wants a, a story that can make others laugh, cry, and most of all believe, is the day that humanity may lose control of the story because we know that the storyteller is the most powerful, always. And as Plato or the Hopi Indians or anyway, someone said, those who tell the stories rule the world. So the moment that the AIs are able to tell those most popular stories, most powerful stories, would be the moment where us being the, the, the smartest species on the planet may be over. And so now for me, when I were to apply those two tests right now, whether to GPT-3 or anything else that I've seen so far, we are way short of, of those. So I'm not concerned personally at all. Actually, I, I've, I've, I've considerably changed my opinion in terms of the timeline of, of, of the birth of such AI. And, and I think it will take longer and it will be harder than uh, people like Ray Kurzweil have anticipated. Uh, I may be totally yeah. wrong, of course, yeah. but but what I'm trying to get at here is like, because it seems that for you, we are either 
there or we're already getting super close to it, which is kind of surprising and impressive to me and makes me question myself, which is why I want to find out more. So are we there or how close are we to those? Yes. So um, I can tell you a couple stories. And, um, you know, my experience working with GPT-3, um, and I was given some early access to it, um, was was frustrating and I didn't really seem to, I wasn't able to have good conversations with and ask good questions with GPT-3. Um, I was I was working with a client who is a, a programmer and deep in deep in Silicon Valley and helping him with uh, his communications, and he also had access to it. And it was also someone who's very skeptical about the the value uh, and and the direction of AI. And when he got access to it, he was first sort of looking at it as just to understand it, but more and more he was relying on it to do the things that I was doing with him, was taking the things that we were writing and asking GPT-3 to simplify, to um, clarify, to, and then slowly to add ideas to. Um, and I was amazed, not just at what GPT-3 was coming back with, and a lot of things that were like, wow, that this, it feels pretty, pretty conscious of what it's saying. And of course it's not conscious, but it, it's bringing valuable new ideas into the conversation. Even more, what I was amazed at was this was someone very steeped in technology who was in constantly telling me the insights that he was getting from GPT-3, constantly sending me snippets of text. So in a sense, this very you know, knowledgeable person who knew what was going on was being extremely influenced by what he was learning and more and more asking deeper questions, not just how should I say this, but what should I do? And getting responses that sometimes would go, you know, like for, in Turing test terms, sometimes would go so far off the rails that you would, you would never believe that this is a real human being because it would just be like that. But if you didn't, if you ask it again and whenever it went off the rails, you kind of brought it back, it was completely coherent. So I would say that gave me a sense of like, that, that's a more important Turing test in a way. Not that you believe that it's another human being on the other end, but that you trust its wisdom and you're influenced by it, choose to be influenced by it, is a more important Turing test in a way. Um, I have another friend who uh, used GPT-3 uh, to take up an original song and feed a script into it uh, based on the song and ask it to make a music video based on the styles, and I think this is public, I think I can send it to you, uh, make a music video based on a certain artistic style and without doing any image creation or image editing produced in about you know 20 hours computing time and only a couple hours of his own time, a complete music video with all these paintings that illustrated the song that was extremely emotional and like and touching as a, and, and probably would be a $200,000, take an artist a couple hundred thousand dollars of time to actually produce a video like that. So I was very taken with both of these examples. I'm pretty amazed by both of these examples. I know it's very easy to also point out all the places it goes wrong. But what I think is powerful is it can learn from those mistakes or it can make those mistakes. So like if, if it puts out 100,000 posts for pro-Russia invasion of Ukraine stories, whatever we call, you know, like little propaganda pieces. And 20,000 of them are so crazy that no one would ever think a human made them. And 70,000 or 50,000 are fairly useless, but there's a hundred of them that are going viral. It can look at those and then it can branch off of those and, and build something based on that, that input. So I, I do think that while it's very easy to point out the places that it crashes and burns and we laugh at it, when we do that, we're missing what it's actually doing, which is um, getting edging closer and closer to being uh, better at, at influencing and manipulating human consciousness than we are ourselves. Mm -hmm. so I think it's close. You think it's close. So, so if you were to guess a timeline, when do you think it will be able to pass those two Turing test proposals that I have. One is asking questions. The other is telling stories that are equal or better than our stories. Um, so I definitely... And are those valid at all to be like Turing tests? So depends how you define really good questions. 
I think that it can do pattern matching now or very soon, but I, now that it, if it just, if you fed it all the transcripts of all your podcasts, it could start asking questions like you. You might not be impressed with the questions it's asking, but your guests might be completely fine um, asking those, with receiving those questions, and they would seem like really good questions. You may see how you're trying to pull on certain threads that it wouldn't know about, but it, I think those questions would be satisfying. If I put you in between it so that you chose, you read the questions to me, but chose not to ask questions that were so bizarre that I would be tipped off, I think it could do that basically right now. Um, and I think the same thing goes for telling a compelling story. I think that there are examples. It, it, you need a human editor to basically step in and break off the, the errant DNA that sometimes gets into these things, but that it can read, you know, the most, the most liked romance novels and then come up with a romance novel that is the kind of killer romance novel that with some, with, with some human assistance could become a, a great story. Um, so I, th I do think it's very good at pattern matching and, at, and making kind of simulations of the patterns that it sees and new, new versions of the simulations. Um, but again, I'm not an expert. I've only seen, only had some hands-on experience and then experience with others who know how to use it better than I do. But I also don't, you know, you're, you're the person with the podcast name Singularity. I don't know how fast these, these curves actually happen. So like once you can taste it and see it, is it, you know, I might say, oh, it's two years from now, but I don't know how much happens in two years in the mind of, in, in a churning AI. It might be two months or a week. Um, it's because it, you never can ch judge the future based on the past when you're well, on Well, it depends on who. You are. It depends on whom you're listening to. So if you're listening to Elon Musk, we have had self-driving cars on fully autopilot since like 2019 or something, yeah. or 18 even. The reality is way far from that in my book. Uh, and, and now actually in, in some of his most recent tweets, he said that self-driving cars may be a much, maybe turning out to be a much bigger problem than originally expected, uh, which is kind of very similar to what uh, Marvin Minsky, I had the last interview with Marvin Minsky, who is often called like the father of AI. I probably had the last interview with him before he died. And famously, he thought that computer vision would be a summer project for uh, his undergraduate students uh, in the 1960s, right? And we're not there yet, we're closer but yeah. we're not there yet. Uh, and of course, the idea is that uh, AI is like nuclear fusion uh, for some people, uh, in contrast to Elon, who thinks it's either here or coming very quickly. Others have said AI is like nuclear fusion. It's always 30 years away. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, think, I think that your examples are, are, are places where um, AI has to interface with the constraints of the physical world and so, some of the constraints of society. Like Twitter, for instance, has none of those constraints, almost none of those constraints. So if your goal, it, it, you know, if your goal is to use AI to dominate Twitter conversations um, in, in a persuasive way, I don't think it's going to run into the same problems that you're going to see with self-driving cars, which do have like the physical world moves in certain ways. The infrastructure can be built in certain ways. Humans can be brought around to accept things in certain, at certain time scales. But so much of our lives have moved into these other spaces that can instantly change. And I think that's where AI will, will and those and those spaces are in some, some ways more important than our roads and bridges. And so that's where I think you're first gonna see AI um, having a kind of dominant impact and doing some of the stuff that seem impossible. Yeah, and uh, those would be closed systems because the world of driving is an open system where you always have new elements and things change in real time, uh, et cetera. But, but I think that, and I, this is where I may be totally wrong, I think that storytelling is also that way. It's it's a living, not a dead uh, uh, activity within a closed system, but it's a living activity in an open system. That's why I don't think that 140 or 280 characters are sufficient uh, to, to, to tell people a story. You can get them to follow on a story somewhere on another platform or intrigue them enough to move them there to get through the story, but you can't really tell the, the full story 
in -hmm. the same way, uh, perhaps. Um, and we should, so, uh, we should meet up again in a year and see, uh, see where things are at. Absolutely. And again, I, I update my, my beliefs as we go. So, and, uh, you know, I'm no expert, just like you. My only expertise, if any, is that I've been looking into this for, for the last 15 or 17 years. Uh, so that's about as, as high as my expertise goes, which is commonly referred to as the fallacy of authority. Uh, so, and I don't consider having it. Anyway, so that's interesting. So, so that's an interesting uh, point. It, it, uh, a view. Uh, to me, actually, those pattern recognition examples that you gave are not sufficient because, yes, computers are very good at pattern recognition. That that's fine. That that's where their strength is. But the the key is not to imitate a pattern, but to create a new one that actually works. Not to tell an old story in a new way, uh, but to actually come up with a new and original story. Uh, so yes, you can imitate me, you can imitate Van Gogh, you can imitate Monet, but can you can you create a revolution, breakthrough of a new style that changes the world like Pablo Picasso did? Yeah, well, that's uh, a, that's an even harder Turing test, I think, than <laughs> well, but but that's what we do, and if we are to to measure them on par with us, which is why we're calling calling it a Turing test, uh, you know, their effect on the world. And and it has to be on on par, I think. Now it's true that Pablo Picasso is an exception of of common humanity, just like you know most of our geniuses, right? So, uh, but I think that's the difference between chess, which is a closed pattern recognition ch system, or Go, which mm -hmm. is the difference between Go and chess is not of kind, but of quantity. Right. It's just that the number of move variations differ grossly, and that's an incredible. Uh, accomplishment, but you know, Demis Hassabis, uh, think about it this way. In 2011, we had AlphaGo defeat the best that humanity can offer in mm -hmm. terms of Go. And then Demis Hassabis came with the, the claim that, you know, AlphaGo would revolutionize the world and all these things. And maybe it's doing it in some smaller way, but he himself admitted around 2018, 2019, that it's not been as revolutionary as he originally thought, and it's not been as profound as he originally thought, and it's not making the same progress as he originally thought. Yeah. Uh, so, in other words, pattern recognition is great. It's amazing. It's not sufficient for AI. It's about creating patterns and all kinds of other things and telling stories in a new way, maybe. Um, okay. So, but that's fine. I may be totally wrong and you may be totally right. And I, you know, I hold my position. I hold my position loosely based on just a little bit of evidence that I've seen, but. But you have more experience with storytelling than me. Uh, and you've had, uh, I think, more hands-on experience with GPT-3. I've just played with it a little bit. Uh, and I, I was like, kind of, maybe that's why I'm underestimating it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so. Who knows? I, I may be totally offline. Uh, I mean, wrong. It's it's not going to be the first time in my life. That's for sure. Um, that, that perhaps can bring us to uh, the story wars and, and the importance of those story wars because those who tell the stories rule the world and they tell tell us what's right and what's wrong and who are the heroes and who are the villains. And as you brought the war today, uh, I've been very depressed, to be honest with you, with everything that's happening now uh, in the Ukraine. And, and, but, but we see this kind of clash of two stories, you know, Putin's stories that, you know, we have to go denazify uh, the Ukraine, even though the, Zelen the president of the Ukraine is, is a Jew. Uh, uh, and <laughs> supposedly Putin is denazifying the Ukraine. So we have, and, and you, you've had this humongous story war on Russian TV for the past eight years by saying that, you know, the Ukrainians are becoming Nazis and the government is pro-Nazi and, you know, our four million people, Russians are being, you know, so you have this kind of story war and the future would be of, of humanity would be determined by perhaps those who win the story wars, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there's ever a permanent winner of the story wars, but you know that that it that it ever settles and you have a permanent permanent victory. But I think that yeah, like that has this the the mimetic space of 
justification is like where you can't have wars without without that. And you know, it seems from from our perspective that Putin's story is pretty thin and kind of like a just a bare veneer over um, what his intentions are. But yeah, it, it, within within his within Russia and within the people who believe his story, it all it all adds up and all makes sense. And there has to be logical sense to it. And um, you, yeah, the, the, that is a key piece of the apparatus that makes an invasion like this possible, that makes any any action in the world on a large scale possible is is the right story that people will buy and buy into. Um, and that loops us back, by the way, to Jonathan Gottschall's solution, which I kind of also embrace. His solution in his book is that story is both the poison and the cure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we can focus on the cure side of things rather than the poison side of things. But, you know, that's kind of unfortunately an imperfect solution because we cannot get out of story. That's how we think. We're yeah. wired for story. So we cannot get out of that mode of thinking, unfortunately. The AIs may have a different mode of thinking. We don't. Uh, well, I think this is where, you know, this is not a, this is a personal solution, a solution for each of us to embrace rather than a solution for the whole world. But I would say, you know, no matter how much you believe that your cause is righteous, a good heuristic for whether you should be telling a story or not is, do you believe that at the core, your story is true? Do you believe it serves the people that you're telling it to, to live their own deepest values and to reach, you know, up onto Maslow's hierarchy of needs or whatever kind of view of, of human self-realization you believe in. Because even if you think your cause is righteous, but you know you're manipulate, manipulating your audiences with a story, which surely Putin understands that he's manipulating his audiences, even if he believes he's right, because we can never decide what is right and wrong for everybody in the world, don't tell stories that you do not believe in yourself and are not authentic to you. You can use it as a tool to share your deepest held truths. And it's a, it's an important tool in the world. But um, once you cross over, no matter how righteous you believe you are, then you're entering the where stories become poison, in my mind. And maybe we should tweak that a little bit, or at least my proposal would be like, because there are truly people who believe their crazy stories uh, to the, the depth of their souls. Like some Nazis were a great example uh, during, uh, you know, even after the end of World War II, there were Nazis who Zig Heiled while they were being executed after the Nuremberg trials and still yeah. believed in everything that they did. So in those cases, clearly that kind of test doesn't, that is not sufficient, I think. And, and I think the, the way to counterbalance that would be with the cost of your story. In other words, is your story coming at the expense of other sentient beings? And you could call that the, the Buddhist uh, suffering test. Uh, is there any suffering to others caused by your story? Uh, and if, if the answer is yes, even if you disagree with those other people's stories, uh, I think that's a very good uh, sign that you should reevaluate uh, your own story because the cost of it may be, may be too high. That's why our humanist story right now, in my view, comes at way too high of a price in terms of the mm -hmm. overall damage that we do to the ecosystem and the planet and countless other species. But Jonah, we are coming sort of to the last uh, six or seven, 10 minutes of our conversation. So I just wanted to ask you uh, another three or four questions in the period that we have left. And, and maybe very briefly, we can touch on where do music and humor fit with respect to story? Which one is more primal? Because one thing that I've noticed is that not only story is very powerful, but the same could be done with music. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I wonder, have you done any research or, or do you have any suggestions for us whether music is perhaps even more primal? Because it has this phenomenal power over us to, to uh, transmit emotion and, and even make us do things, right? Like dance and shake and jump and, and do stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and maybe humor uh, would be right out there right after music. I don't know. How, how do you put those with respect to story? Um, well, I don't have any expertise actually about music or research on it myself. I mean, I know that in creating a powerful video or a powerful movie, like the 
as you understand the emotion you're trying to create, you want the music to follow that emotion and we know that it can create emotion, but I don't have anything insightful to say about music beyond that, I don't think. Uh, when it comes to humor, I think that uh, two things, it, it goes back to the earlier conversation we're having. One, humor often comes from the unexpected happening. And when you, know, when, when you least expect it, something happens uh, that, that shocks you awake into the, and that, that feels funny often. And that really goes with the story being memorable. Like, you know, if your story is kind of at this level, all the way through and kind of at a flat line, it will not be interesting. The stories that are constantly breaking expectation and giving you that shock of, of realization are stories that become more memorable. So I think that humor is just one, a very powerful way of breaking expectations and making something memorable. It also is disarming emotionally. It puts us in a place of feeling connection to the storyteller because sharing humor is often a way of recognizing that someone is um, on our side, is means well. And so it's a powerful way of when discussing rich and deep topics or challenging someone's beliefs of disarming their, um, their disbelief. So I think humans, humor is extremely important in that way. Yeah, I think humor is one of those th things just like music that can actually bridge the gap between the left and the right or people with diametrically opposed views and, and get them at the same emotional level uh, and, and therefore in sync in yeah. some utterly like mind-blowing way, maybe subliminally, uh, even it's so it, powerful. It can also be used as we see like with meme culture to paper over some very violent and awful things and just, oh, it's just a joke. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's disarming in that way as well. Sure, yes, yes, just like story, just like story. Okay, Jonah, third last question. Where does your latest book, Unsafe Thinking, or, or how does unsafe thinking fit within the stories that we're kind of talking about here today? Um, yeah, I mean, I think unsafe thinking is about breaking patterns of thought and breaking patterns of behavior. And how do you do that when what you're doing is no longer working? So in a way, storytelling, we have these patterns of communication that are fairly broken, most of us, because we have dismissed or don't understand how to enter this sort of story framework, which is very human, but it's not, is no longer passed down to us generation to generation as a participatory thing. And so I think that, you know, the, the books fit together in terms of like, we take the same, unsafe thinking is about taking the same actions and expecting a different result. And how do you, once you realize you're doing that, how do you break out of it? I think storytelling is one of the most clear ways that we then break out of those patterns of leadership in business or leadership in, uh, in politics or, um, creativity, storytelling becomes this powerful way of getting off the conveyor belt that's no longer working for us. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, Jonah Sachs, where can people find more about you and your work? Uh, JonahSachs.com is my website. Um, for some of the reasons that we've sort of touched on, I'm not very active on social media anymore, um, but uh, I can be reached through my website and we can have further conversations. Fantastic, which is what I do, and I highly appreciate your time here with us, and which is why I always give the last word to my guests on my show. So, Jonah, we have been talking for, uh, let's say, maybe about an hour and 40 minutes, an hour and 45 minutes. What should, what do you want us to take away from this, conversations, from this conversation with you? What's the message, perhaps, that you want to send us away with? Well, it's been a fascinating conversation, I'll say it first. And, you know, the message that I bring to this conversation is really that storytelling is uh, the neglected and secret weapon that we all have in, 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 in finding influence and sharing our values. And that's my most common uh, message that I, that I do want to share. And I hope that people of goodwill and we're trying to build a better future um, will pick up and get better and better at. Um, but I've, I've, You've, you've stimulated in me the, the, the thought too about sort of how do we question um, the direction that we're going? How do, if we don't really know what the next chapter we're trying to write is, you know, how can we be effective in, in going forward if we don't know where we're going? And I do think a lot about that question, but I haven't necessarily always brought it into these storytelling conversations. So I, I think you're absolutely right that we need to be both exploring and questioning our own assumptions about where we're going, even as we get better at trying to push in that in the direction that we think is best so um yeah you stimulated me to think differently about this conversation wow that that makes me incredibly happy because you know my comp my hidden agenda that i have in all my interviews here is to 
to have a good conversation with my um, interviewees and to provide the best of them to my audience, but also hopefully all of us uh, end up going in a new space, a space that we haven't been in before. Uh, both as a as me as a as a, as an interviewee or as an interviewer, you as an interviewee and and a, and a kind of a storyteller, and then our audience a, 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 as in their own right. Uh, so so if I've managed to accomplish that, then then that's like uh, my my dream come true. It's it's what Socrates did. He he helped people. That's the meaning, the original meaning of the Greek word symposium. You know, uh, mm. symposium means a drinking party. Mm -hmm. And people would go have drinks and eat, but at the same time in ancient Greece, they would discuss poetry, love, beauty, ethics, aesthetics, war, death, uh, religion, the good, uh, you know, all those things. And hopefully at the end of the party, you would leave not just drunk, but with a little bit more of an insight in a new, uh, a, a new perspective uh, uh, of the world and of the issues that, that make a difference in our life. And that's what Socrates is known for. Uh, that's what he did. Well, you've done that for me, so thank you so much. Jonas Sachs, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. 